UFO materials have been recovered and examined and the findings have just been released and this is going to blow your mind. There have been countless witnesses to UFOs through history, with many accounts of spacecraft coming in many shapes, colours and sizes. What we've never had though is a sample of UFO to test, to see what the components and materials are, what makes them tick and to see if it matches up with our own periodic table, until now. On the 12th of February, the Seoul Foundation released results they had from UAP material examination that they had undertaken. The Seoul Foundation brings together experts from academia and government to address and the philosophical policy and scientific problems raised by the likely presence on the Earth of UAP. One of the founders goes by the name Gary Nolan, who was in charge of examining these raw materials who presented the evidence at the Seoul Foundation Conference. And that is what we're going to be looking at today. And one of the videos on the Seoul Foundation YouTube channel goes by the title Gary Nolan, PhD on the material science of UAP. And um, honestly, when I saw this, I clicked it so quick. I was so excited to see this. Now, the first part of the video kind of gives a bit of backstory as to how they acquire these um, UAP materials and how they go about testing them. I didn't think that was really too necessary, but if you do want to check out the full video for yourself, I will be leaving a link to it down in the description. But we're going to be getting into the nitty gritty stuff from the UAP crash sites that they talk about and then what they found from it. So, Get yourself bloody excited because uh, we're going on a roller coaster today. Um, so the first case, and this is the case that we published uh, in uh, basically last year, and it was with Larry Lemke, uh, a, po a postdoc of mine, and um, uh, and uh, well Jacques, sorry. And so again, it's about the evidence. You can't just take anybody's claim that something is the truth. So this is one of the best and most uh, widely observed at the time uh, of cases. Now, I like this because we're already off to a very good start here. This is peer reviewed. So it's not just one person's looked at it and being like, this is concrete factual evidence. It's then been passed over to other people within this organization who have then looked at it, double checked it, added any extra findings or verified the findings in the first place. So, you know, it's a brilliant start and it's something to kind of really bear in mind moving forward. Um, multiple observers, etc. I won't go through them all, it's not necessary. But, uh, you know, a hovering object and then something seems to slough off and drop to the ground. And some people were like, they were literally only with about 500 or so feet from it. So the police, luckily, were called. Um, and, uh, and here's, you know, here's one of the observers down here in red another observer, another observer, and this is where they ran to. And what did they find? This is one of the actual original photographs. Um, we have them. Um, now, this is incredible because this isn't just like, you know, people going, look, I have this extraterrestrial spacecraft material. This is my findings. This is like backstory. This is where it was. These are the people that witnessed this craft. This is what the craft was doing. This is how we obtained this piece of material. Like, I watched it and I was just completely blown away because it it's so, like, verified. And uh, it's a big pool of metal that was in the process of cooling. Okay, so how did that, how did that get there? So, you know, they went through uh, all of the possible reasons it could get there from hoaxes through thermite through a meteoric crash. I mean, who would think this is a meteor? It would have left a hole. Uh, um, space debris re-entry, all of these things were dismissed. So, uh, but of course, it's just something sitting in the, in the literature. Um, and this is where we published that paper. Um, and just, you know, so there's always this question I get about reputational damage. So Suzun Jiang is on this paper. He's now a professor, assistant professor at Harvard and over in the medical school. Didn't hurt him. They fought for him. There's Suzun right there. So the first technology that we brought to this is the, one of the ones that was developed in my lab actually by Mike Angelo, who's here, um, Michelangelo. Reincarnation. And, and nobody is. I mean, when he showed up in my lab, uh, he was, I thought he was crazy because he was all excited about something that he thought we could do. And I thought, you know what? It sounds possible, so let's do it. So we took these materials. Oh, this was, we had a big chunk of this material. We took five different 
pieces of it, very small pieces, because these things require tiny amounts of material to study. Because you don't want to look at just one thing if you can. As long as if it's, if it's relatively inexpensive, you want to look at multiple places. You want to, as we say when we're looking at the, uh, at the tumor immune interface, we want to sample the, we want to sample the ecosystem. So took multiple things, just to make sure. I like that as well. Like that, again, it, like everything indicates to professional, proper work. You know, not just one sample, multiple samples from what they're deeming the ecosystem from this piece of material to see any if any properties vary and things like this. You know, it sounds like there was a very thorough job done. So, you know, the first thing, as you all know, we went and looked at isotope ratios. We didn't find anything. They looked absolutely normal. Um, but I, I noticed something in these signatures, and those are the metals that came out, is that the ratios of the elements were different from one to the other, right? So that means it was not homogenous. Somebody didn't put it in a blender and make a, you know, make a, a uniform distribution. I mean, if you're making a material for something and it is different in different places, uh, then you're gonna have structural issues where one part might be uh, less or more bendy than another or more likely to crack, etc. Now, that's interesting in itself because you think if you're gonna make a shape, you know, I mean, I'm not a metal person. I don't make shapes out of metal. You know, I don't, you know, take this with a pinch of salt, but you know, you take all the components you want, you kind of melt it down and then you form it how you want it to be formed, all right? Whereas this, he's talking about obviously having different components in like, imagine you've got like a, a sheet, a 30 centimeter sheet, and different parts of that sheet have got different components. So you've got a very strong part here, you've got a flexible bendy part here, and then a solid rigid part here, um, a firm, but still Fox kind of bendy part here. It's like all over the place. And uh, you know, the question is, how did that not cause structural insecurities? But if you think about the way that these crafts have been said to be able to move to stop dead, from moving incredibly quick, almost suddenly, propel up, down, left, right, forwards, backwards, literally at the speed of sound, you gotta think, like, that's incredible. And maybe these components being in the, the shaped in the way that they are, maybe that adds to that. So that, that was interesting. That, that means when this stuff, when it was dumped there, however it was, but we'll take the word of the, cause it's fun, right? I mean, uh, speculation, ends up being a headline, Stanford professor says, Harvard professor says. You know, no, it's speculation. It's just a, a game to play in your mind. So you have these different ratios, which means that before it was dumped out, it was incompletely mixed. So wh what does that mean? How and why would you do that? This is where it gets so interesting. Um, I mean, were you offloading something that was problematic? You know, we all heard the stories about how these things might wobble and then something happens, somebody, another one shows up and they fix it and then they, they go off merrily ever after. So, uh, and these were just the ratios. Uh, and, and there they are. So they're not slightly different. So what have we got here? We've got a thing that's aluminum or aluminum, depending on where in the world you, it's aluminum. Just gonna put it out there. I think that's silver. MG, is that gold? Is MG gold? And then FE, or is FE gold? I'm gonna have to Google this quickly just to find out, make sure I got my facts right. MG, periodic table, we say it. Magnesium, okay, magnesium. And then I think FE might be gold then. FE, periodic table, da -da -da -da. iron. Okay, FE's iron, so I was completely off, but I'm pretty sure aluminium, silver, magnesium, and iron. They're completely different. Right, so depend, everywhere you look, it's, it's, I, I've explained it before, like you have chocolate and uh, vanilla ice cream along with strawberry, you let it melt, you give it a couple of twirls, and where you, where, wherever you look, there's gonna be a different ratio. So, but, so what can we conclude from this? It's clearly the result of an industrial process. Now, that is telling, all right? If this was a meteor, like they, or meteorite, like they, they speculated to begin with, it, it wouldn't have gone through an industrial process. It would have been naturally formed. Um, if it was down to any other natural phenomena, it wouldn't be industrial processed. 
were processed. Get them, get them very American. I'm watching a lot of American stuff recently, so I'm, I'm, my, my twag is getting a bit, bit American, but it's going through an industrial process, which means that it could, it has to be made by something, which opens up the possibilities of so much. It's not the machine. Maybe it's exhaust. Maybe who, who knows? We don't know. Um, it had incomplete mixing of components. That's a conclusion, right? I always talk about data and conclusions that, you know, it's about the data, not the conclusion. Get another scientist to agree with the data, that the data is real. And now you get to ask them why the onus is not entirely on you, right? There's, there was no signs of any technology and no exotic isotope ratios. Okay, so... That's disappointed that there was no sign of technology, but again what i do like is that this is not conclusive and he's stressing that throughout this that this work is not conclusive this is just data that they studied from these samples from what they've seen they can't conclude anything apart from the fact that the incomplete mixing um which was conclusive um because that's literally what they could see that these components were not complete through the the mixing process you know can we look deeper? I mean, that's a pretty high, that's from, from, I mean, from a, you know, a structural analysis point of view, if I'm talking about atomic, you know, machines, this is like the 30,000 foot, but it's what was available at the time. And it, it wasn't really something that I had uh, thought about much, but then, you know, can we do this? Can we see, can we see smaller? And why would we want to do that? Well, like with the immune system and cancer cells, the, the proximity of where one is relative to another actually predicts the outcome of the cancer and the, whether the therapy will work or not. So we went to this instrument. This is atomic probe tomography. And atomic probe tomography is a, actually a very well known and used technology, but it's expensive and there's only a few of them around. Um, but what it does is it literally takes the sample apart atom by atom, about a thousand atoms a second, and it figures out where the three-dimensional, uh, its three-dimensional placement in that. Wow, just wow. But right, we've actually got technology that can do that. Let's just talk about that for a second. So, so here's the, uh, here's the idea. You create an electric field, an electric field differential. You set it up so that you have, are evaporating the sample. And where it lands on the detector can be triangulated back to where it originated on the sample. And so, and what do you get from that? You get a map of where things are. So there's, this is the world's, at least public, first, uh, UAP alleged material uh, studied at the atomic level and collected at the atomic level. So we are looking at history right now. This is history. How incredible is this? This is uh, the Council Bluffs. It's a tiny, tiny thing. I mean, it's like, it's like uh, literally uh, two or three microns cubed, but there's millions of atoms in there. So, I mean, I knew that I wasn't going to find any structures, but this was an easy thing to start with. Uh, and then you look, at the, you look at the complexity of what's in there. So the first thing that, for instance, they were trying to explain this thing away as, as it was just industrial steel. Well, it's not industrial steel. Now, that we, now we literally have things that industrial steels don't normally contain. But now we can go in and look closer. So here, for instance, this is 3D. Now we're inside the structure. I've taken away the iron, which is so prevalent as to be, would obscure everything. Now we can see the position of where everything is, right? Again, this is just a trial, but now we get to see potential structure. So I would say that if we're going to study any of these other materials that seem to have novel properties, uh, this would be the way to do it. I had hoped to do the bismuth magnesium case uh, before I, well, we, we tried it, but it, it fell apart in the instrument under the stress of the local forces. It was just too crumbly, unfortunately. There's a way to fix that, but we couldn't do it in time for this. Um, because that would have been cool. I think that would have got a, a bunch of us jumping up and down, but I'm gonna do it anyway, it's coming. Um, so you can look at all the individual atoms. You can't really see it so much. So those are uh, the things that I showed you on the, on the other page. Those are the individual atoms. Um, uh, oh, sorry, individual elements. Uh, there's some hints of uh, p 
potential differences here. Um, but it's such early stages that um, I don't dare repeat, I, I don't dare say it until I repeat it. There's a lo lot more, I, I'm not an expert yet in APT, but I will be, um, you know, in this. And by the way, this was, uh, so the individual who's been helping me is uh, Alex Bolton. You've seen him around. So uh, he actually helped create uh, all this analysis and because we just got the data Friday. And while I was busy frantically dealing with Stanford administrative messes, um, he, he basically saved my bacon on that. But there's data, right? Now this is data. Um, material shows no sign of technology. The material is clearly the result of an industrial process and it was incompletely mixed. Okay, so why? I, again, that's the, that's the question you ask all the time when you see data. It's like, why? why? Why would you do it? What could have generated it? And why would you dump it in the middle of a field in a small farming town in Iowa? I don't know. I don't know the answers. I mean, that is a big why, isn't it, really? I mean, maybe there was just no logical explanation. Maybe, you know, this was something... I mean, this is in the realm of speculation. I, I haven't got a clue. But it could be as simple as it, something just was a bit wobbly and it fell off. Just, you know, it happens. Um, I don't know because, you know, I'm, I wasn't there. It's not... This is completely out of the realms of anyone's real, like, expertise, if I'm honest. This is the first time we're ever kind of exploring this. Okay, so that's one case. There's another famous case, Ubatuba. 1950s, is a primary witness, but we don't have it, never, nobody ever had access to the primary witness, but a Brazilian journalist who received the evidence, uh, and again, through uh, the offices of, of Jacques, I was able to get access to some of this stuff. Um, and it, th this is actually what I don't quite understand is because, as you'll see from the result, it was claimed to be pure magnesium. Uh, what I was given was not magnesium. So, but we have two things called moisture A and moisture B, and that's Spanish for sample, I think, somebody said, um, told me. And then this is the instrument that we used, highly accurate mass spectrometer. Um, and just, you know, this is how, this is the beginning of sort of how science is done. You, you don't want to measure different things on different days because you want the experiment to be done under the most similar conditions that you can. So those samples, two examples of each of those samples along with a, a zoo of other things that, that Jacques happened to have, um, were put on this and then we did the analysis. And I remember sitting there when they, we, they printed out the data, and I was like, I don't understand this. I mean, I hoped that something like this would happen, but I never understood it. Um, I still don't. So one of the samples, claimed samples, has a, you know, pretty much exactly the natural thing. We had two, sh you know, two shards of each. The other one was way off. Way off. I mean, just no doubt. Um, Okay, so why? 1950s, isotopes. If you mentioned isotopes to a 1950s crowd, they'd duck and cover, right? Because isotopes, and still, humans use, the, like one of the most important things we do is we make nuclear bombs out of them. Um, of course, they're used uh, in other, for medical purposes and tracing. Um, but we don't have any chemical or material reasons to use them. So. Okay, so what's, what's going on? So one had not, why change the isotope ratios? Back then, it was extraordinarily expensive to do these kinds of separations. It's still expensive. I mean, my lab orders extremely small amounts of different isotopes uh, from the uh, periodic, from the, the lanthanide series, because we use them as tags in our biology experiments, because each of them is unique. Um, so, for the uninitiated, what are isotopes? Again, this is, thank you, ChatGPT, and it made some things up, of course. But, you know, um, the, the idea here is, you know, humans work with elements, but somebody is playing with isotopes, so why would you play with isotopes? 
because they're supposed to be the same. That's what I was taught in chemistry. That's one hell of a question. I mean, we obviously, like he's just said, we use isotopes for nuclear warheads, for, you know, things like that, radiation, all the rest of it. But, and we obviously make things with materials and with elements on the periodic table, iron, silver, gold, aluminium. Um, I'm just saying aluminium to piss off the American people because they'll be like, it's aluminum, but it's aluminium. Anyway, but someone's literally messing around with things that we use to blow stuff up on a mass scale. Let that sink in. Like, they're using that and forming that to create structures and craft. Maybe that's where humans are going wrong, but mind boggling. Well, it turns out that's wrong. Now, people are starting to look at isotopes because you have an extra neutron in the element, and that changes the electronic configuration of the, of the orbitals just slightly. And so in the right circumstances, having that difference would be sufficient to make a better catalyst and so people, pharmaceutical companies and others are starting to use this, starting to understand that, hey, there's something interesting here. Silicon, some of the uh, isotopes of silicon make better qubit holders that last longer than others, than the other three. Okay, so there it is. I mean, it's, it's there. Plants use it. Actually, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so there's something yet to be understood. Okay, so this was the first time that I had gone beyond just magnesium, uh, looking at the Ubatuba material. And even though we, we looked at the magnesium, because that instrument that I just showed you can see down to the parts per million, um, we were looking at that level. When I looked at this, it was almost entirely pure silicon. Okay, well, what's the natural state of silicon? Uh, sand, silicon oxide, quartz, things like that. Um, it doesn't come prepackaged as 99.999395. Yeah, you just don't get it. So why is somebody tossing that level of purity around? Because uh, again, it would be, that would be expensive to make. Um, so why would, you, why would you do it? So again, we go in. So many questions, and I know I'm sat here pretending that I know what he's talking about. I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea what he's talking about. So, uh, you know, I'm so glad that he's given us the idiot's guide to physics and biology here and uh, everything else. But, you know, he's, it, it, this is just it, it, unfathomable. And we go in and we're collecting this data. And by the way, I'm showing all of this because all of this will be going eventually on the web and I wanna do this with every material that I can get my hands on legally. Notice how he says legally there. This is something that I noticed when he first said it, legally. That, there's definitely an undertone of this man's got some stuff in his lab, illegally, um, that he's testing on. So yeah, just a little nod there. Like, I'll be like Lou and, and Chris sneaking something out the back. <laughs> but they weren't, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, Chris is gonna kill me. Um, Good. Um, and so again, look at, the, look at the numbers there of the percent. There's lots of other things in there, but the vast majority is silicon. The reason why it shows as lower is because I broke it down into the silicon um, uh, isotopes. And they're, they're natural levels. So here again is the 3D, where we can go inside. And you know, so one of the next things to do is to say, well, is there, uh, is there any sort of strange placement of the atom? So those are the three uh, nucleotides. Uh, and is there a likelihood for one thing to be near another? And that's what we do, again, in immunology. We look for certain cell types that are more or less likely to associate with each other. And that tells you that, huh, if that happened above statistical chance, then there's probably a reason for it. Things don't happen, usually in biology, by coincidence. Um, the two samples are pretty much within statistical certainty to be similar to each other. So that's interesting. Um, so even though they came from separate chains of custody, uh, there's enough data here at least to say that whoever prepared this stuff uh, either had identical preparation techniques or it came and it was broken and given into two chains of custody. Again, it's data. No sign of technology, but certainly signs of an industrial process. And that's important.
Again, very similar to the last one in Iowa. No signs of technology, which is gutting, but there would have been some, there's some form of technology behind its process and a high level of silicon. Like, why silicon? So, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm saying this thing about the silicon. If anybody can tell me why pure silicon should be thrown around a beach in, you know, Brazil, I want to hear it, you know? Um, so the material is clearly a result of an industrial process. It wasn't found randomly. Nobody found it on the side of a road. It was associated with an event. And that's important here. Another noteworthy thing to bear in mind there is, you know, this coincided with an event. If this was just found, you'd have your doubts, you'd have your quibbles, you'd be like, yeah, I'm not sure about this. But it happened and coincided with extraterrestrial supposed phenomena. And then this was found. Like, it just adds to the, the credibility of what's going on. And uh, because that coincidence, it doesn't prove that it's anything but it, it, but it makes it, to me, more interesting. It opens the door to a lot more questions. Unusual levels of pure silicon with contaminants. So again, what, what would you do? So the, the, the event was somebody saw something with, supposedly with lights, and then it dropped something which exploded. OK. Why? Right, what, why? What, what's going on? I don't understand. Um, because on the one hand, we have these metals that drop. I have, an, I have another sample of something from Australia. Uh, there's a couple of other, a couple of other uh, events um, that actually are dropping molten objects. So there's a reason to offload something. Again, I'm speculating. There's a reason to offload something, but every time they do it, it, it ends up being slightly different. Now, that's exactly what I was going to point to next, is the fact that there's we've gone through two cases so far. Both times they've come up as two completely different structures, elements, makeups, all the rest of it. The only two consistencies, no sign of technology, industrially made. Now, does that mean that this is two different alien civilizations who have gone through two different processes to create their craft? I mean, if you think about it, Human cars, yes, there are wide ranges of models, cars themselves, the way that they're built, but the consistency is what's made or what they're made of, how they're made. The process is the same, which is exactly the same as these craft. The process is the same. And the elements, if there was two cars, would be the same. Whereas with this, the process is the same, but the elements are vastly different. Why? I I'm starting to sound like him now. So does that tell you that there's many ways to achieve a similar goal? Right, so that's kind of you know, sort of back engineering the thought process of why would you, why would you do something like this? So, here's another case, very famous case, Socorro. Again, this is something from from Jacques. Uh, on an Indian reservation, the uh, police officer was in was an Indian was Indian. Um, he's driving along. Uh, he hears a noise. He sees something, a shiny object in a field. He observes little people outside of the object. The object takes off kind of with a burst of flame. Um, you know, and of course, when people tried to debunk it, he's, they said he, he saw the star something or other. You know, he's a, he's a trained observer. He's a policeman, right? So um, he didn't want to talk about it. So he wasn't seeking publicity. He just did it. So, I, so Jacques had a piece. He gave it to me. Um, and now again, adds to the credibility. You've got a police officer in a career already who isn't seeking publicity from this story and, you know, witnessed what he witnessed. Can he explain it? Can any of us explain it? No, not the point though. Point is, something was left behind for us to examine. And again, it comes hand in hand, element of whatever this material is, story. You know, again, we take an electron microscopy. Everything looks like it's, you know, from another planet uh, under, uh, under an electron microscope. Um, very simple. Aluminum, zinc, mostly, and some contaminants. But the aluminum and the zinc are in different places. So this is at a... Yeah, al al aluminum and zinc are in different places. A, 
a distance, so there it is. So there's the aluminum on the top, there's the zinc on the bottom, or vice versa. Now, zinc is, zinc's the green, yes. But it's, it's differently distributed. It's the contaminants that are interesting. That's what I'm interested in. Because they're kind of a signature. Is, are they uniformly distributed throughout the thing? Meaning, or are they somehow next to each other? So we looked at that. So now, if I look in the aluminum on the top, again, it's incredibly pure. It has like a single oxygen molecule amidst a million. I don't know who does that and why would you do it. It's attached to a zinc thing underneath, which has some aluminum in it, but look at how it's non-uniformly distributed. Right? There's like a, a cluster of it over here. Is that because they have a junky recipe? They didn't mix it right? It just is. But why? Don't know. Again, this case, I mean, this is clear, clear sign of engineering. I mean, the interface between those things is, is like exact, down to the atom. Clearly the result of an industrial process. So this, of course, is not the only way to look at atoms or looking at materials at an ultra high resolution. There's many other of these kinds of devices uh, that do different things, but none of them have the uh, exactitude that an, an APT has because uh, they provide at the five or so angstrom scale and they're getting better. Um, and so I won't go into all of the others, but why, why do I show a table like that? Um, because we're actually starting a new initiative, uh, Starboss, Stardust Repository, taking a page from Avi. Everything is made of Stardust. Setting up standardized testing, so basically creating a federation of other scientists to whom we can go and pass the material along, because doing all the things you want to do would cost a bazillion dollars, so you have to have other people doing it more or less for free, um, or at least at, at cost. Uh, I mean, by the way, that thing that I, all those things I showed you, that was $40,000 to do that at a service center down in San Jose that does it and uses it for microelectronics. Bonkers. I'm going to stop the video there before he gets on too deep into the Stardust thing. We'll get reeled into that because, yeah, that's not the subject of this video. If you want to go and check out the start and the end of this video, like I've said, there will be a link down below. But $40,000 to examine micro, minuscule bits of craft to get the results that we have. This is history right here. Now, the Soul Foundation was obviously made up by a lot of well-known people within this field, one of which being um, David Grush. He was also one of the key figureheads in the creation of this. Uh, but, you know, they've got countless videos on here, all uploaded from the same seminar. Uh, they've got 4, 8, 12, 16, 18 videos uploaded. 17 if you discount the introduction. Eight, uh, 17 videos all from, from this, right? And it's, it's pretty incredible like the findings that they've got from all different departments so i really really do recommend going and checking it out i mean you know i did do a little bit of research on gary nolan i mean he did say um not too long ago that neil degrasse tyson the very famous astrologist scientist um should have his phd revoked because he uh, is dubious of ufos and alien life forms i mean make of that what you will but it, yeah regardless this is incredible stuff like incredible incredible stuff and the more that we find out from this man and the surrounding people within this department we could really unlock some doors behind the true potential of these craft and how they work and it can also validate or discredit sightings that we've had and whistleblowers that have come forward i mean god i'm getting ahead of myself but i want to hear your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below what do you make of this whole process do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? Why? Why do you think that? Let me know in the comments below. And until next time, well, first of all, before you go and do that, be sure to jump to get the hell out of that like button. Subscribe if you're new. Tickle my little bell so you get notified whenever we upload. And until next time, I hope that you have enjoyed. Cannot wait to see you in the next one. And I'll speak to you later. Peace.